I am on land ceded from the Menominee tribe to the Oneida Nation. We acknowledge this land we stand upon today as sacred, historical, significant to the Menominee and Oneida Nation, as well as the lands of the First Nations people. So it's very appropriate. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Candy Cornelius. I am from the Oneida Nation, and I am also part of the Menominee Nation. So that uh, land acknowledgement really, really was meaningful. Um, I had known many people that had said it and you know, different conferences I attended, but this one really hit home because I am uh, part of both nations. So thank you. So today, why we are here first, I just kind of want to put some facts out there. Uh, we had awesome presenters before. I kind of jot out in their names because I just want to give them a shout out of what great information, uh, experience and knowledge they had. Um, and I can see how our presentations, um, like Cami said, I don't want to repeat. Um, so I'll just kind of highlight the things maybe they didn't cover. Uh, but this is what we know and why we're here today. So nationwide, we know maternal mortality has been a long-standing public health issue. And for me, that kind of stood out because that's my area of work. I'm in the public health arena or community health, as you'll see in uh, tribal nations. Uh, what we also know is that American and Alaska Native women have a higher rate of maternal mortality. So this should be at the forefront uh, of our action as far as improving that. And working in prenatal care uh, for the last well, 11 years, um, and many others have noticed a big shift in the method of delivery. So we kind of think, is this shift related to the increase in maternal mortality? If you talk to many doulas that work in the community, um, midwives who work, you know, kind of like Cami said, right in the on the grounds with the people, they'll say, yes, definitely, there's indeed a link to the increase in rates of maternal mortality. So we'll kind of go over that and some other points about specifically um, medicalization of birth. So today's topic, um, as everyone knows, um, I kind of didn't get a, a good idea of who the audience was, but usually when I do uh, presentations about historical trauma, Native Americans, I kind of go over terms. Uh, just know that everybody that they are interchangeable. American Indian Alaska Native seems to be most often present in the research that you look for. The topics um, are, that's the term they use. Native American is common. Um, indigenous people is the newest one. Me personally, I'm Oneida and Menominee. Those are the nations that I represent. So um, if you work, if you are not Native working with Native people, just make sure you ask them, what tribe are you from? What nation are you from? Um, so we'll go over the population size. Um, similar to, I believe it was Janelle, she had said uh, starting from the history of a group is so important. It's like our presentations <laughs> were in line, <laughs> Janelle. So I, I really appreciate the information you shared. It kind of coincided with mine. Um, so we'll go over maternal health in general, nationally, childbirth history, uh, Oneida Nation women past practices, since that's my expertise, um, and impacts of historical trauma. And it's just a brief overview. Uh, Janelle did an excellent job um, doing the real in-depth um, talk about historical trauma events. And then regional and local data that is out there. I recently did a presentation for NACHIP. It's a uh, medical group uh, through UW Madison, and they asked me to present on a topic that I was an expert, I was passionate about, and it's maternal health. So I got all this specific uh, research and studies uh, from their online library. So um, basically, nice, reliable sources. And then I think something different that uh, people didn't touch on is we'll actually go over um, possible solutions. For me, I'm always like, okay, here's the problem. Now what, how can we fix it? Let's brainstorm. So hopefully after this institute, I think the next step, like in the brainstorming, maybe we can create these smaller groups. And you know, one of the things was we heard a lot was the tribal led MMRC. So that obviously is a, an, a topic. I was gonna say, next slide. <laughs> So to start out, I always talk about the population size. You'll hear a common theme of there's not enough studies, there's not enough research because of the population size. It's true. So, and uh, as they had said before, we talk about a group of people that um, pre-European contact, 
resided on majority of the United States. Then you go to the blue map and they hardly have any of their own ancestral land. As stated before, there's over 500 recognized tribes, but only in 30 some states. So there's 20 states out there probably with Native Americans, but no land and not sure if they actually are identifying as um, Native American. And then only a little over 300 have their own land. So many are not even from where their ancestors are from. And that is mainly due to, um, like Janelle had talked about the relocation, all the different things that had happened to many different groups of people um, over time. And another thing I noticed um, and maybe in other tribes also is that there's a big shift starting to take place from many tribal enrolled members to tribal descendants. I'm not sure if anybody, we briefly talked about maybe blood quantum, but this also would be kind of a barrier and we really need to brainstorm of how we can help true Native Americans, Alaskans identify, even if they're descendants, because they had said, we're the only ones that have a, a number attached to our identity. But I know many descendants who live on this reservation, who are part of this reservation, my own daughter's not enrolled, but here work, contribute back to the community. But if they were, if I wasn't here to guide them, would they mark on that census that they're Native American? That's kind of what we have to find out um, in going forward. Next slide. So the 2020 census, um, this was actually very beneficial and hopefully will lead to a lot of talk today about funding. And that's always was my concern is we get this great amount of money, a grant for three years. So 2020 census, the Native Americans uh, included, um, made an effort to do the make it count campaign. It was mainly because they found that most Native Americans were not even counted. And then there was a huge uh, decrease in amount of pregnant women that actually counted their unborn child in their census. So just think of all those women that were pregnant years before didn't count that as an extra person in their household. So this 2020 increased the race and ethnicity uh, questions, which was an advantage. Um, so you could be uh, Alaska Native, um, American Indian as a sole race or in combination with another. So this revealed that the U.S. population is much more diverse in the past measures. And remember that the census has been going on since 1860, but we haven't really been involved or the way we're counted has changed. First it was, are you Native American? Then it was, are you Native and what tribe are you from? Then it was including the Alaskan Native. So it's really hard to look to past ones to see any growth or decrease in growth in Native populations. So um, good and bad with the census. But for this one, you can see this new data basically showed a, an American Indian Alaskan. In 2010, there was 5 million. And with the new questions, it went up to 9.7. Now I'm thinking there wasn't a huge baby boom <laughs> during those 10 years. I'm thinking a lot of people probably identified with two or more races. What if somebody was Native American and Hispanic? Which one are they gonna choose? Native American and African American, which are they gonna choose? So this time they were able to select that there are two more races. And now that uh, included to be like an 86% increase in the Native population. So multiracial too, even with the different changes, they had over a 200% increase in the amount of people that were actually counted. So this is really beneficial and makes me optimistic that it may help shape that federal funding to send more money. Maybe we can actually um, advise and request longer durations of grant funding. Next slide. So childbirth history. I learned all of this in one of the classes. I'm a childbirth educator. I'm a certified lactation counselor and a prenatal nurse. So tons of information and trainings coming through my way, but this one really caught my eye. Um, and I kind of remember birth stories, asking my grandparents, my grandmas, what they remember, and they didn't remember much. And learning this really set the stage and made me realize why. So if we start at the 1800s, many know before technology, before uh, the medical profession, it was women helping women. Um, just like Cammie and her group are returning to, that's a lot of the Native women want to return to that. 
and they're in their homes and obviously no medication available, so it was natural methods. In the 1900s, it was still a little bit of that in-home women helping women, but it was in the 50s that there was this huge shift of basically the introduction of medicalization of labor. So we've seen over 80% of women going into the hospitals. And what I've read about uh, the say curriculum of the OB doctors or the family doctors at the time is they learned about the complications. So not what should happen. Here's a woman coming in for normal labor and delivery. It's I'm prepared for things to go wrong and I know what to do. It was that was the focus of the um, medical curriculum. And if anybody hasn't heard of Twilight Sleep, you'll never forget it <laughs> after this day. Twilight Sleep was the combination of two drugs, first in Germany, and they said these German um, lab assistants kind of tailored and worked with two, two medications, the morphine and the scopolamine, and found a really good dose combination, gave it to their women where they would uh, come in, present in birth or basically in labor, I'm having contractions, give them this medication, and the women would wake up and have their baby in their arms. So no memory, no pain. That was in Germany, well studied, slowly tailored out to the population. Well, American women heard about this, and that's what kind of was um, shocking, is American women said, we want that no pain birth, bring it here. Um, so they marched and they demanded that same type of medicalization. So it was, you know, at women's hands in America saying they were pushing away that normal labor and delivery. So it came to the uh, U.S. and unfortunately at a really high pace um, and introduction. So they did not do the, the studies and the slow introduction. It was really put into place fast. And as you can see, um, it kind of co coincides with the um, rate in maternal mortality. In the 1900s, there was like 850 women that had passed away per 10,000 births. So something obviously was done incorrectly too quickly, uh, kind of learned from it and went from there. But that's just uh, an example of kind of like uh, the demand and the needs. You know, it, it wasn't safe, but it was demanded. So it was implemented. And the pictures here also are pretty shocking because the women actually would still be moving. They had hospital beds, but they had to have um, like barriers around the hospital beds because in one article they say the woman would be, you know, flapping her hands, would stand or sit up, you know, so they were moving, but they don't have no memory of this. And when it came time to push, uh, they obviously weren't in any condition, so they had hide their um, legs to the stir stirrups. Um, so very, very medicalization, very extreme births, obviously leading to a lot of deaths. So switch came, epidural was introduced in the 70s. Obviously that was studied a lot uh, more and proven to be safe. And then we go into the 200s and we come back kind of full circle, which I really like. So Doctor still present, and then now we have the introduction of certified nurse midwives. I'm a great fan. Any patient will say, who do you recommend? I said, I'm, uh, I'm kind of biased. I recommend the nurse midwives. I'm a nurse. Uh, they have a different model of care. They have a provide more education, more support, and kind of promote that normal spontaneous vaginal delivery because it has so many benefits. And then the come in, more coming of certified midwives. So these are non-health professionals that uh, get experience, uh, some training to deliver usually in the homes or like a birthing location. So now we have a combination of everything um, here in the 2000s. And you can tell by obviously the death rates went down to seven. And then unfortunately in the US, this is why it is a huge concern. We see this reversal. Maternal, maternal mortality is resurfacing. So obviously action needs to take place um, soon and especially among our, our native women. Um, both my grandmas, Oneida and Menominee, when I asked them about their deliveries, they said they didn't remember much. My Menominee grandma said she remembers being, be, waking up and she was wrapped up like a mummy. And that's all she remembers. She goes, I just remember we wake up and I was like a mummy, why? So they must've just kind of had, you know, 
maybe like an ACE bandage type thing to for compressions for the uterus to shrink. And then she said she didn't see her baby for a day or two, probably because the meds were wearing off. And then my Oneida grandma said she remembers she had, she goes, I don't know what they gave me. I went in, I had, you know, contractions and they put this nose thing on me. And I think it was ether, she said. <laughs> Same thing. She don't remember that birth experience. And uh, relating that, then I asked about breastfeeding and she says, I I couldn't, by the time my babies got to me, you know, either I had no milk or nobody was around to show me. So we can see how obviously these uh, medical interventions really uh, harmed the normal pathway that women were, were used to. Next slide. So like I said, my expertise, um, I'm Oneida Menominee. Um, I was raised here on the Oneida Reservation. All my life, I live here with my three girls. Um, so it's important to know, like I said, when you talk about US, the uh, childbirth history, and then we talk about a group of people. I go into uh, future you know, nurses, uh, school nursing, uh, future teachers and talk to them about historical trauma. Or a lot of times they want to say, tell us about the health disparities. It's so easy to come in and talk about, we have high rates of diabetes. Our maternal mortality is rising. Our infants are suffering. You know, I can go in with all these negative things, but we need to start from where a group of people started. What is their history? Like Janelle had said, because originally it's going to, we want to come full circle. We want to go back to those traditions and way of life. So United Nation people, uh, like most, they hunt, fish, and gather. The United Nation is actually from New York. And like I said, from the kindness of the Menominee Nation gave us land here in Wisconsin. And that's where we reside now. Um, so longhouse was the way of living. And just think of a big family uh, home, lived up to 12 families. And I used to tell my niece, I said, just think if we lived in a longhouse, all of your aunties and uncles would be living under the same house. And, you know, she just loved that idea. Um, I was fortunate to be raised with these values. Um, it takes a village and, you know, my nieces are like my own, my nephews are like my own. Uh, and like Cami, I love the concept of doulas being your aunties. I work with so many women that are so alone and just need that one additional support person. And that's how we originally, um, that was originally our way of life. Then you fast forward to uh, 1700s, which included, uh, as before, illegal treaties. Uh, they tried to assimilate us. They tried to remove us, um, all types of historical trauma. So really knowing where, if you're in a particular state, uh, working in an IHS facility, get to know that particular tribe, those nations. Or if you have several, ask about how their uh, way of life used to be, because that's going to be the end goal to get them to be healthy. Next slide. So as far as United Nation women, uh, if you don't know, uh, tribes can be uh, patrilineal or matrilineal. We are matrilineal here in Oneida. Um, so the women have uh, are considered a sacred and powerful beings. And matrilineal meaning I would take uh, my mom's clan uh, since my mom was Menominee, we were adopted into a clan um, opposite of my dad. Um, women are honored and respected. Uh, if you ask also, if you're working with Native people, ask about their creation story. It's like the most beautiful story. And ours can be told, I was told in three days, in three hours, in three sentences. But the picture below with a woman on turtle's back is basically the sum of our creation story. And it tells you everything you need to know about that particular nation, uh, what foods are valuable, the animals that are you know, valued, uh, who's the leaders, how the earth was created, all of that. Um, and women are also creators of life. So it's a special gift to ensure that next generation. It was an honor to have children um, to ensure that next generation. Our, our women are clan mothers. Um, they hold the the title to the territory. I thought that was actually an awesome job. So it's um, kind of like the lease to the land. It is in the hands of a woman and it is up to her to make sure that uh, we are taking care of things correctly. And um, our traditional system consists of chiefs. And at any time, if the chief is not uh, making decisions, the women can actually veto and um, take over that decision. 
And then it's her responsibility also to watch over all the chiefs and remove if actually inappropriate. Childbirth was viewed as an honor and a privilege. You can see how we kind of got away from that with all the medicalization options. Um, I still include this in my childbirth education classes that it's a normal process that women bo women's bodies were created for. I said, our, our bodies are smart. We have everything within us that we need to get this baby on earth. Um, in the past, women helped other women. Um, so it was a, a nice um, sacred and strong circle that the baby would be brought in. Um, and then more actually women in our community right now are delivering in the homes. I know Hikami had said that's a pretty good rate that 30% are saying, I do not wanna to go to the hospital. Um, and especially in the times of COVID, I had very reluctant moms. Um, early discharge was an option. So they would deliver, mom and baby were healthy 24 hours and they would, be, they would leave. Um, so most often, as you can see in these pictures, women actually like left the village to deliver and then were surrounded by other women. Um, while I was in college, I uh, had the chance to interview a, one of the certified midwives and she had told me, I said, just tell me a little bit about labor and delivery uh, and a Native American perspective. And she had said the same thing, like our, our bodies, we have everything we need to. And she said, consider it like a goal to climb a mountain on your own. She says, that's your goal. You have your mindset. You go and you go and you go. It's hard. You're halfway through labor, 10 hours in. <laughs> How would you feel if a helicopter picked you up, placed you at the top of that mountain? Would you feel as accomplished? Would you feel as proud? And that stuck to me. That really struck home with me. And I thank her for that story. And it actually helped me through all three of my deliveries, normal vaginal deliveries, no medication. I brought my babies into this, onto this earth. Next slide. Like I said, just a quick overview. Um, the other uh, pres presenter did a great job at going through all of these. And like I said, I'm still learning today. When I started doing these presentations about a handful of years ago, I really had to look and I had to look hard and I had to ask people. Um, some of my own history, my dad's dad, uh, I didn't even know they were a part of the Relocation Act and how we got here from New York. So I went to a local high school, none of this was taught there. So this is something, maybe this is one of the goals is to provide an overview of historical trauma because it explains the immediate effects, you know, from that next generation and then the multi-generational effects that we talked about. So I just kind of group them into similarities and I don't just go from there. So if we think of acts of violence, just think of a group of people in constant warfare. They don't know when they're gonna be attacked. The other one is extermination. They don't know when, you know, the signs are out, uh, you know, rewards for killing an Indian. Um, just think of how that would make a person feel. So we go to the immediate effects. If we look at how this, uh, I guess, affected the women, they lost a lot of their men providers. Who was hunting for them? Who was providing for them? Who was, um, creating and making their shelter, that um, hypervigilance, knowing, you know, like when, are, when is somebody gonna come again, living in that constant fear, just think of how that group of women and children fe felt. Then you move forward and could this be the responsibility for all the altered stress response? Definitely. Could this be the reason why Native Americans have a high rate of mental health disorders? Definitely. Um, acts of separation, every tactic was used. So they did treaties, moving people from their homelands, from the only thing they knew from their indigenous foods. Relocation, my grandparents uh, were moved from Oneida, Wisconsin down to Texas. Different environment, um, like said before, you know, torn away from these large family units and then boarding schools, that huge act of removing children and starting the assimilation process. So the immediate effects, loss of, loss of land, and then those indigenous foods. So for us, just think New York natives, luscious lands, we're able to hunt, fish, and gather, get placed in Wisconsin, flat farmland, we have no waters. So it was a, a tactic, a, a good tactics, like someone said, um, 
securing that food source was a way of to get rid of um, many tribes. And then that loss of family unit, that village, not having that surrounding um, immediate extended family uh, to help in time of need. And then the multi-generational effects, this have led to chronic diseases. Definitely, you've seen the PowerPoint before of the Kamats <laughs> foods we were given, which weren't very, very healthy. Um, and then I see tons of isolation and no support. A lot of times women are coming from Nebraska. will just pick up and leave because it's not a good place for them and relo relocate here with no support. Um, and then the boarding schools, we see that loss of culture and then victims of abuse the immediate effects on those children, those young women who eventually had offspring. And then the multi-generational effects are loss of identity, self-medicate, substance abuse, and then a huge mistrust in the educational system. This was a huge factor for me. Um, my grandma did not trust the teachers. Her teachers were really mean nuns. That's what she used to tell me. So for education, she was really reluctant to send her kids off worried about her grandkids going to school and not really knowing a lot about the Menominee history and culture. Acts of injustice was this rem reminder, this is just in the 60s, that Child Removal Act where I think there was a book on it, how, um, how to assimilate a native baby was the title of it. So they were taken purposely native children out of the home and placed them into white homes. And that was obviously fear. Uh, in Maine, there was this great video of how they're trying to heal from um, children that were removed and not knowing who they are in fear that somebody's gonna take them. Um, and then what does that do to people today? Definitely huge isolation. Uh, once again, I have a lot of clients that were adopted and want to actually, I wanna know my, my native parents. And I try as much as I can, connect them with resources because they have almost like that missing part of themselves. Who, who did I really belong to? And if I was Native American, why was I taken out of that home and put into a non-Native home? Imagine a child, a young person trying to, you know, understand that concept. So them, just them, think of them turning as parents if they're gonna trust the social service system, probably not. And then someone had also talked about sterilization. And this was just in the 70s. And she gave some really shocking examples of um, they were aiming at full-blooded Native women and they would go in for an appendectomy or any other type of procedure and come out with uh, being sterilized. So here uh, it is, the effect immediately is that woman not being able to have kids. And if that is her traditional role and that's how she's brought up, just think how she would feel. And then that leads to mistrust in the healthcare system. So a lot of these multi-generational effects really hit home to me to share with providers and to educators. Uh, when I sit with the future teachers, I was like, Johnny's not doing his homework, you know, or Johnny doesn't come to school. Let's backtrack and see about his home situation. Let's reach out to the parents. Or Sally doesn't come to her appointment. She's non-compliant. You know, really think about that person's history and then their parents' history, which could have led to this mistrust type of issue. Next slide. So epigenetics, someone had quickly mentioned fascinating information. It finally hit home to me when I read this as far as the high rates, especially of mental health disorders and um, specifically depression, anxiety. So one particular definition is it can explain basically the multi-generational effects. This means that trauma memories experienced by a person's ancestors can be stored in their genetic makeup, can leave a scar on their DNA, can activate a dysfunctional response to stress, can increase the risk of anxiety and depression. So if I wasn't exposed to trauma, but, and even if my mom wasn't, but her mom was, that DNA could have been altered in my mom and then passed on to me. It totally makes sense. Um, a story to also kind of push the point is uh, of lab rats. If you think about lab rats, 
And I think of that was their only home. They were never exposed outside. They don't know what cats are. They shouldn't be alarmed. It's not a, it's not a true trauma. It's not a true fear for them because they haven't been exposed. So the scientists put all these non-exposed uh, baby lab rats in a cage, put a cat hair in, and all of them fled to the end of the cage, shivering, scared, and just shook. And why? They shouldn't have even known what that cat hair represented, and they shouldn't have even had that stress response, that fear response. And then once it was removed, they said they never returned to their normal rambunctious self. So that altered stress response actually led majority of them to uh, a mental health disorder. And I had one of the students almost in tears. She was just like, that is insane. But that's DNA. And just remember that is trauma that could possibly be passed on from generation to generation. Fine. So going forward on our topic today, maternal health in the media. So when looking into um, articles and sources on this, I ran across an article in the New England Journal of Medicine, and this was just in 2018. And these um, kind of headlines stood out. So the NPR News had a series called Lost Mothers maternal mortality in the US. So obviously it was a concern. This is four years ago. The New York Times had said closure of rural maternal services. So even we know something's going wrong, we're closing services. And I know someone else had mentioned the closure of a facility, which was greatly needed. Um, and then the US Today had a TV series on deadly deliveries discussing increasing maternal mortality. And this is just nationwide. Just think of if we had media and articles and you know situations for uh, native you know catastrophes, how that would be. So this is unfortunately what childbearing women have to see. Even today, when I told my sister-in-law I was presenting, I wanted to say, "Don't tune in. She's pregnant." <laughs> I didn't want to share this information with her. It is scary. Um, and I hope after today, we can work together to start making some change. We talked about it long enough. We really have. So hopefully in the end, we'll start to make change. Next slide. So uh, pinpointing on American Indian Alaska Native women, basically um, like the signs say, how high do we need to go? So we know that um, Native women are more likely to die of childbirth pregnancy related causes more than any women in any other country. And they are twice as likely to die from pregnancy related causes than white women. These are facts for Native women. The Journal of Women's Health Study abstract stated, despite important and appropriate attention to disparities for black women, almost no attention has been given to American Indian Alaska Native women. Reading that just made me sad, sad but true. And why? So to me, when I really start making this PowerPoint and thinking about it and seeing uh, other, say, changes and activists, it really reminded me of the, um, like it's a similar battle as the missing and murdered Indigenous women. Uh, they also were fighting for Native women. They weren't getting the attention they deserved. We wanted our women found. We wanted our women saved. But none of this was happening. And it was through a grassroots movement that began all of this awesome work. And we've seen it in the headlines today, the great laws and policies that we're doing. So we must, must remember that our women are sacred. And if we can't do it on a public health, or I know um, Hannah had said, what can we do to break down the, you know, the barriers to get into say public health departments or tribal buildings? Maybe it has to be a grassroots movement. I've seen so much great work done with these women um, in basically fighting to be heard. And that's what we need to do today. We need to get our voices back and to be heard and to start saving our sacred life givers. Slide. So to shine a light on Wisconsin, uh, I've been in the uh, prenatal field for about 11 years. And this is what I see um, Wisconsin has done. I found five practices 
that they had and majority of the goals, if you read through, are to increase the number of healthy babies, to support moms, um, and then help providers. So the number one is prenatal care coordination. That's my particular title. It is funded through the state insurance. So it's uh, Badger Care Medicaid reimbursement. So I see women, educate them, support them, and I'm able to uh, get some reimbursement. I don't make millions, but at least it's something that we can put back into our IHS facility. And mainly I see first time moms and guide them throughout pregnancy and up to three months postpartum. Definitely a great program. Um, and then the other is first breath program, the second one here. This has also been around since I've been in the practice, basically providing women with one-on-one uh, -on -one counseling to stop smoking, which we know our rates are pretty high among Native women. So that's also a good program. And a new one, newest one that came out is the Periscope Project. Um, this was amazing. This is provider to provider teleconsultation, education materials, so it's, for instance, it would be OB provider sees a pregnant woman and say she has a mental health disorder and he or she doesn't know how to treat them. They can call this Periscope Project, get a psychiatrist who has uh, expertise with pregnant women and help them with medication monitoring. So they are the experts and they're saying to all OB providers in Wisconsin, call me, I'll help you. We'll walk through this. We need to take care of this woman's mental health through all her pregnancy and after. So great programs. Next slide. And these are the practices that I see in the hospital. Now, the last one I'm gonna note several times and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the last really change in OB practice was the March of Dimes elective delivery toolkit in 2013. And I remember I started in 2011 and I went to a conference and I learned about this in 2013. And I didn't really know why it was brought up because my, my uh, pregnancy and my friend's pregnancies, they were always term uh, first, you know, in the 90s up to 2000s, there really wasn't a huge shift in method delivery. But um, once I started looking at it, it was those uh, providers who said, I'm going out of town, let's just go ahead and induce you at 38. Or mom saying, I'm done being pregnant let's get this started, <laughs> those types of things. So this toolkit, and it wasn't a mandate, it was a toolkit that they devised, shared with all the hospitals, and they actually got their buy-in. So one study showed uh, early elected deliveries before 39 in a group of 25 hospitals declined by over 80% using this toolkit. So it was just providing them with information, research-based, and I, I have a hint, it probably has to do with a lot of brain development. We know baby's brain development goes right up to the 40th week and they're missing out each week, each day that they're born too soon. So this is another possible solution if we look at a particular toolkit for hospitals or clinics. And the other one I learned about was standard protocols for OB emergencies. So these are in hospitals looking and training for the most common causes of maternal mortality. So cardiac, they would have a cart ready to go. Hemorrhage, they would, they would have blood on standby. The wait wouldn't be long. And preeclampsia, what are we gonna do if the mom has severe high blood pressure? Um, if she started, starts to seize, what are we gonna do? Unfortunately, many states are different and it's not required. I went to a conference and one hospital did an excellent job where it was mandated like twice a year, these hospital staff had to simulate these emergencies. Uh, when I call a couple of local hospitals around us, they said, oh yeah, we have, we have these kind of crash carts. And I asked when the training was and it's kind of as needed when we can. So that's another area maybe we can pinpoint on is actually preparing our hospital staff of how, how to deal with these emergencies so we don't lose any women. Next slide. We get into statistics. This is what I found with my previous presentation. And when I kind of went to the online sources, there was hardly any data on Native Americans. And that's gonna be an overall theme is we need more studies. So the common themes I found is what I'm gonna share. There's just three areas um, and then some possible solutions. And so the first is adequate prenatal care. I thought was really interesting. I ran across this one article and it said, U.S. prenatal care has been an important public health intervention. 
However, the effectiveness is unproven. We tell women to go to their appointments. Uh, we tell them how important it is. But what, is, what are the birth outcomes for somebody who made it to all their appointments, more or less? So we know um, in the regional data, which is Wisconsin where I'm at, uh, Native Americans go to about 60% of their visits. It's pretty average. Here, the PRAMS, which I'll talk about later, the Wisconsin uh, survey, again, about 60% um, go to majority of their appointments. And then up here, about 60%. So um, about average, you know, a little over half go to the recommended amount. And ACOG defines adequate prenatal care as that initial visit within four months and then all the recommended visits after. So anywhere I tell women like 10 to 12 and they say like 13 to 15 visits. Next slide. Possible solutions. So if we know prenatal care um, is questionable, could a study be done about it? The one study I did find in the 2017 journal was of 3,000 women. So they had 30% had 10 or more prenatal visits, average or what's recommended. 70% had under that, which probably is where we are as um, in our population. And then the women that had over 10 were more likely to be induced or delivery by cesarean. So to me, that was like aha moment, like, wait a minute, this needs to be revisited. <laughs> Uh, as far as prenatal care, as um, that's part of my job is to make sure you go all your prenatal visits, make sure your tests are done. But it maybe in the later part of the weeks, as you know, women are seeing more discussion and options of medical interventions are brought up. That's what we need to find out. So more studies, um, OB providers, I would encourage you to expand patient education on the risks of these labor interventions. If we are going to induce, this is what's going to happen. Not only verbal, a lot of my patients say, yeah, they said they said this and they said that. Nothing in paper, you know, so really expand that knowledge so they can make a really good decision and then promote that shared decision making. Um, remember the healthcare system, it, it's intimidating. You know, you might have patients that are fearful. So don't decide at that one appointment, maybe have them come back, do the, the pros and the cons. I always teach my uh, childbirth education participants the risks and the benefits because all that information may not be known and a quick decision actually could lead to a deadly result. Um, stakeholders, which hopefully are you out there and any community members, ask patients about their prenatal care in your area. What do you see? Do you see them going to all their prenatal appointments and what are the outcomes? And then really advocate for more research regarding quality and quantity of prenatal care. We always, you know, once again, we're, we're advising what's recommended for the majority of all races. But as Native Americans, is this actually the route and the safest route for our Native women is to attend all these prenatal visits. Next slide. The second one is method of delivery. So this one is uh, my top concern. Um, cesarean delivery in the US account for a third of deliveries. However, the long-term impacts are unknown. Way too many C-sections, and I've seen that over time. Started in 2011, and it was just this huge shift in inductions, cesareans. They were primary or repeat, and a lot of medicalization, and kind of wondered why. So if we look at the, the data nationally and then regionally, the average is about the same, but really the main point is this huge stagnant. It just stays the same, doesn't drop. The US has little or no change in the increase of vaginal births over the year. Instead, it's the opposite. We see more repeat and cesarean deliveries. So method of delivery, really thinking about that. And like I said earlier, is this a link to the mortality rates? Something to look into. Slide. Possible solutions for this. I had said PRAMS before, this uh, awesome survey in Wisconsin. It stands for Wisconsin Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System. So for in 2020, we had the awesome opportunity uh, was given to Wisconsin to oversample American Indian Alaskan Native women. Finally, we get this big group of women and get some real hard data. 
So I was lucky to be able to share some of the preliminary results. And the first graph you see here is um, induction from healthcare providers. So this is how much they were possibly influenced. So if you look at somewhat 10%, very, quite a bit, it's four, and extremely went up to seven. So if we combine like the last two, that's about almost 12% of women. And you add that, that's over 20% of women that are saying, yeah, I was kind of talked a lot about induction or, you know, felt somewhat pressured. Uh, birth mode right here uh, shows the difference between our population as far as normal vaginal and cesarean. And then if you go over to this other gray one, it talks about method of delivery for all ages. And PRAMS does all ages, and they also group it by under 30, over 30, I believe. So really gets a good picture of age. Um, and here we have uh, vaginal 65, and this is the VBAC, which I was talking about. So that's vaginal birth after cesarean, we're at 2%, very low. And 16 would the repeat, and then cesarean would be like primary. So if we added all cesareans for Native American women in Wisconsin, it's over 30%. And the sample was about over 500. The total amount of women in Wisconsin that were um, interviewed or surveyed was about 1,600, also included Black, White, and Hispanic uh, women in this survey. And PRAMS has been going on in Wisconsin for about since about 1987. And um, I had asked if we could include it again in the future. However, they said it's a very large amount. It's uh, you know $10,000 for that extra sa sample. So there we go back to money. Um, but it would be good to, there we go again, find future funding so we can continue this type of data collection. And it tells us what we need to know to make basically effective interventions. Slide. So what do we do about method of delivery? So the research community, I hope some of you are out there, basically more studies on health outcomes of mom and babies that experienced a cesarean delivery. Did anybody ever look at that? That's my first thought I went to is, we have these cesarean babies. Did anybody track them five years, 10 years? How are they doing baby-wise and mom's health? There was this one study that looked at the micro makeup of a cesarean delivered baby versus vaginal birth. So they took skin swabs of a baby that was born cesarean and baby that was born vaginal huge different opposite makeup and they found actually a slight linkage to more autoimmune disorders in the cesarean because they weren't exposed to that normal GI vaginal microbes as they would for normal vaginal. So very interesting and obviously more needs to be looked into that. Um, I'm excited to announce we actually will have an upcoming study here in Oneida Nation with UW-Madison regarding method of delivery in Brown County. So I hope to present on that. Um, in the future, a medical student, Native medical student reached out to me and said, how can I help? What is your burning question? She had heard my uh, lecture at UW and I said, method of delivery. So she went in, found all kinds of great uh, public available data. And um, we're gonna start with, we started with uh, polling the providers and we are now submitting our uh, request to interview patients. Uh, OB providers, uh, I would really take a step back and complete a self-evaluation and reflection regarding method of delivery. Um, they say the cesarean rates are tracked and reasons, but really, you know, we talk about uh, bias. Sometimes we don't see our own biases. Really take a step back and evaluate and look at your particular clients, Native American especially, and the medicalization of labor among them. And always provide patients with risks and benefits, like I said before, um, and then really promoting patients to attend childbirth class education. It's not a shout out to me. I like people in my class, but we've gotten away from that a lot. I remember when I first started teaching, I would have five to 10 couples, and now I have maybe have two to five. So a lot of that I know is technology. They think they can, you know, look online, watch a video, but attending a class really goes over risks and benefits, what may not be covered in um, regular OB visits. And really I teach them to be good advocates for themselves, to speak up, to ask questions, to even if they don't trust the health system, 
to walk in knowing that this birth experience is in their control. You say not, can you delay cord clamp? And you say, how long will you? <laughs> uh, not will you do skin to skin, do skin to skin and make sure it's the maximum amount of time. You know, really giving them confidence and knowing the terminology that they need to and knowing the risks and benefits. So childbirth education class and breastfeeding class are obviously highly promoted. Um, stakeholders out there support pregnant women in pregnancy, encourage um, all risks and benefits are known. So if you know somebody that's pregnant, really push them to attend a class. I know the younger ones are like, yeah, my mom, my grandma told me I should come. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you're here. Um, and advocate for more regular and consistent patient education on the labor medical interventions, maybe even policies set in place where the provider has to, you know, if you were to be induced, they would have a packet on it. If we were going to go to cesarean, you would have a packet on it. So they would know before and ahead of time um, risks and benefits. Fine. Uh, if we could wrap up in about five minutes, Candy, that'd be All right. Great. Yep, I'm near the end. So maternal mortality, obviously why we're here today, the CDC reported 700 women die a year from pregnancy related complications. And we know that Native American women have even a higher rate than white women. So here goes through regional data. Um, here in 2018, DHS said there's about 25 women in Wisconsin that died a year, way too many. Um, postpartum related deaths uh, most often occur. So we kind of know the timing of it and we know the age and we know some of the causes. So we really need to jump in and pinpoint interventions toward these, toward these facts that we know. And the medical student found this awesome data. It was, of course, no native specific, but within an eight year span in Brown County, there was about seven deaths per 100,000. And here, this graph just shows the common causes. And it's also good to know, we all know, 2019 CDC had noted US rate was 17.4, in 2018, the ones that they reviewed with 60 being preventable. I repeat, preventable. So hopefully we can do something about this. Next slide. And this just goes over if we know where to pinpoint the interventions. For this time span, we know Native women and pregnancy is the most common. Okay, so more education, more intervention while pregnant. We know the leading causes, hemorrhage, cardiomyopathy, hypertensive disorders. What can we do about this? Could any be, anything be added to uh, monitor the heart? And then we know the age, 40. Next slide. Solutions basically is to focus on those preventable causes like I had reviewed. Somebody mentioned the AIM bundles for the hospitals and I'm appreciative of the AIM bundles for the community members. I'm definitely gonna take a look at those. Um, more studies, um, and then OB providers really acknowledging that this is a devastating problem for our Native women, and we need to advocate and make some changes. And like someone had, and I think a common theme besides more research is that tribal-led um, MMRC. Next slide. So these are things actually being done on the ground now, um, and the highlighted here. The other ones are just more work and done. Uh, another focus is postpartum time. Um, ACOG had said there needs to be a new model of care. I think Cami said, instead of a mom being out there for six weeks by herself, we need to bring them in. And I tell my clients that who come to class, I'm like, you're out there by yourself for six weeks. I'm going to tell you what you need to know so you're safe. Um, and then more um, Native staff in the, in the perinatal workforce, like Cami has done. I wish and would come to Wisconsin and duplicate your doula program. Um, Navajo Nation, uh, they had highlighted there was 40 women that got trained to be doulas. They said to help confront the tragedy plaguing women in Indian country and learn how to help their own. Arizona maternal mortality rate was the highest 70 per 10 or 100,000 births. And for Oneida Nation, we have more women choosing to deliver in the homes we have trained our staff on cultural awareness, and we are in the process of developing a trauma-informed training for staff. Next slide. 
Barriers, remember not all interventions are going to work depending if they're rural or urban. Very different scenarios. Population size, so we need to be inventive of how to get more people um, to check that box, unfortunately, or to self-identify as Native Americans so we can make larger uh, studies and caseloads. And then social determinants, this one was also mentioned. I have a really, I'm kind of on the fence with this. It seems to be an obvious fix, okay? We deal with poverty, we deal with housing, but one study noted college educated American Indian women had a higher pregnancy related death than all other racial groups that had a high school diploma. So obviously more work needs to be done in that. And also remember, improving your social determinants, live in a house, live in a nice house, have a nice car. But if you're dealing with some internal traumas, fixing those social determinants is not going to help, um, I guess, the outcome. Next slide. My last slide, I just wanted to, if anybody's out there, um, basically we need to get to the root of the problem. Like everybody says, uh, trauma-informed care talks about getting to the root. Is there some other uh, emotional, you know, traumatic events that women need to deal with so we can start healing and having healthy women pregnant um, and live to see their baby grow and become um, healthy adults? And I'd like to dedicate this to Stephanie Snook. I had read her article. I read about her in an article. She's a member of uh, the Alaskan uh, Shishian and the Tlingit tribes, and she was an activist for the U.S. Indigenous Women's Health. Um, she has been a part of many activists' movements. She resided in Washington State, and she was pregnant with twins uh, only before a few weeks before she was going to complete an interview, and she actually passed away from a cardiac arrest, and she was only 37 years old. So I hope I can make a fraction, and we all can work together to make improvements, like I said, for our sacred life givers and improve the future. Slide. Thank you for taking the time to learn about um, the maternal health data, the possible solutions, and I guess I'll just open it up for any questions. Sorry for the fast pace, but um, most has been said throughout the workshop, and I think we have very several common themes. We all want to work together and make positive changes for our women, so thank you. Thank you so much, Candy. That was incredibly informative. And um, well, I'm working to, uh, and, we, and we greatly appreciate you sharing your time. I have a couple thoughts going on in my head at the same time, but thank you again. That was a real pleasure and a treat. Um, so uh, we are going to break out into some discussion groups and um, to really think about kind of the future steps and where you can apply what we have talked about today to your work and towards maternal mortality prevention. Um, we've come up with a couple discussion questions and I'm going to share my screen again and just to kind of go over um, what we'll be doing. We'll break out and then we'll come back and share. Um, it would be nice if you in your groups selected a um, person to share out what you have discussed and we'll be posting some questions in the chat as we move on through. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you will all be able to self-facilitate your groups um, because of just the number of NIHB staff. We don't have enough to cover all of you, um, but uh, hopefully we can all, you know, have a good conversation and talk about some questions and then um, come back together and we can ask Candy and Cami questions um, if you have any. Unfortunately, uh, Janelle is, is not with us. She She's very busy, so her schedule um, brought her away, but um, hopefully we can have a little more robust discussion to wrap up this institute. And, okay, I will create eight breakout rooms. You're gonna be assigned automatically. And please go to your rooms. I hope this works. Okay, oh my God. 